Okay, then I will get started. So hello everyone, my name is Han Chen. Again, thanks for having me here. And today I'm very happy to present uh, two of my research works on leveraging digital trace to understand remote collaboration dynamics. So first, let me uh, briefly introduce myself. So my name is Han Chen. I'm a fourth year PhD student in computer science at Stanford. I'm also doing a PhD minor uh, in management science and engineering at Stanford University. And I'm probably interested in computational social science and uh, HCI, especially on CSCW. And my work has been dealing with uh, collaboration and future of work um, through both computational and HCI method. So I've been working with a number of different uh, professors uh, around campus, including Professor Demokola and Dajowski, and also frequently collaborate with Professor Michael Bernstein. And I have been doing research at a number of places, including Tsinghua, MIT, UMD, Microsoft, and Tencent. All right, so um, today I'm happy to present a number of works that I've been doing in actually since the pandemic um, using digital trace to study how people work. So why have I been interested in this? There's a number of motivations for that. So first of all, as we know, the information workers even before the pandemic have been increasingly relying on digital platforms to communicate and collaborate. So many of us are familiar with, for example, Slack or Zoom, so Microsoft Teams, where we are using instant messaging applications to coordinate with our coworkers or using Zooms or other uh, digital platforms such as Teams or Google Hangouts to meet with uh, collaborators uh, through a synchronized way. So basically, even before the pandemic, uh, information workers have been increasingly relying on digital platforms to communicate and collaborate, which is kind of like the foundations where there's going to be richer and richer digital trace to study how people work. And the second thing that really accelerates this process is, as we probably know, the pandemic, where more and more information workers, they have to stay at home. And while companies, they're starting to encourage people to work from home, there are more and more you know, collaborations and communications as well as work getting down at work at workplace uh, that is unusual uh, in that people are more and more working from home. And um, there are more and more remote or hybrid collaboration going on. And so this kind of pandemic is really shifting the, uh, is making some kind of a workplace revolution and making things really different from, from, uh, from what we know traditionally. So what is enabled by this kind of you know, transformation, of digital transformation of workplace? So one big thing that is happening right now is that people's work patterns are, much now, uh, are now much better recorded under remote work settings. Because in contrary to what we have um, in more traditional setting where people collaborate face-to-face -face or uh, mostly face-to-face, in a digital setting or in a remote setting, most of the collaboration and work, uh, work patterns now they have been recorded somehow on their digital platforms, especially in a remote setting where, you know, like instant messaging apps, if we record how you coordinate with your collaborators and video conferencing tools will have some kind of digital choice where we are, you are meeting synchronously with some of your collaborators, where there are perhaps other documents like ShedDoc or some other kinds of work platforms which record how you get actually get things done. So uh, all of this is pointing to the possibility that um, given the increasing rich digital trace, it's probably a good opportunity uh, that we could have now uh, compared to in more traditional setting to have this opportunity to better understand uh, the patterns behind how people work. And it's also giving possibilities to design better productivity tools to better support people work and collaborate. So this is kind of the, like the broad motivation behind my, uh, behind my work. And now I will dive deeper into two more concrete work uh, to give you a better picture of how I've been leveraging this kind of digital, uh, digital trace to understand uh, people's work patterns, collaboration patterns, and how we might uh, think of some design implications on top of this, uh, the, the observations that we have through this large scale data. 
So the very first um, works that I would like to talk about is actually a collaboration with a number of folks at Microsoft Research or, and Microsoft Office of Applied Research. And this topic is on large scale analysis of multitasking behavior during remote meetings. Um, and this paper has been published at Kai last year. So when we start to work on this, um, this project, what we are motivated is really by something that we experienced quite often during the pandemic period. And especially when this work was getting down as it's in 2020, where uh, most of us just for the first time spent so much time at home uh, and looking at, you, you know, collaborating and working with others over video conferencing tools. So back then, at least um, myself and many of my close friends, as well as colleagues, they're having this kind of um, they are having this kind of experience of multitasking during remote meetings, and they are keep saying that Zoom making them fatigue, and they they, didn't, they just cannot concentrate on Zoom. Um, so there are a lot of experience like that. So based on our experience, then um, we are wondering: um, Is it the case that everyone is finding hard to stay focused during remote meetings, and they are trying to get other things done? And so this is kind of like the motivation behind this particular research. And what we find is actually, you know, multitasking is ubiquitous on the remote meetings. So it's not a lot, you are not alone if you are having multitasking behavior during remote meetings. So the goal in this uh, particular work is that we are trying to achieve a systematic understanding of remote meeting multitasking behavior. Why is this important? As I have said, remote meeting has becoming more and more ubiquitous, even before the pandemic. And remote meeting is actually something that is pretty central to remote work or hybrid work nowadays, because you know you need to have some ways to stay connected synchronously with your coworkers. And it's probably a better way than than say instant messaging applications or other applications where you just connect with people asynchronously, because um, there have been research showing that through synchronous connection, like video meetings, it's probably a better way for you to stay connected with your, with your coworkers, collaborate, and function as an organization, uh, because people need a sense of you know getting together. Um, this is a so so basically, remote e meeting is the major way where people collaborate and work together with each other um, under this kind of remote work despite physical distance. However. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, most of the work done uh, previously is, you know, like everything seems to be face to face. And although people they do sometimes they do video conferencing, it's not that frequent, and it's more like um, most of the, my coworkers are, you know, are, are working face to face. I'm having a phone call, having having some kind of video conferencing for a time, time. But most of the um, we, we just do not have a very good idea how we are collaborating or how workers are collaborating with other, others before the pandemic. But it is really like this pandemic is making uh, a natural experiment for us to, to study uh, what are people doing uh, when, when they're connecting to each other asynchronously. Prior works on remote work, remote meeting, they're generally very limited in coverage and they are mostly qualitative. So most of the studies is like, you know, they recruit a number of participants and they, they, they observe, they either do a thorough study or they, they do surveys or other kinds of um, qualitative approach and looking at how they're working during the period. But it's, it's quite limited in scale and, you know, it's not, uh, it's not clear whether the patterns could be generalizable to a larger population. So um, that's why we are motivated to using digital trace here in this particular um, study. And then to our uh, second motivation, why studying multitasking behavior is something important. It is just, it, it's something beyond, um, you know, like, like the curiosity to understand whether people are not paying attention as, as we do. So studying multitasking behavior is actually something of a quite long tradition. Many people, and especially in psychology, they have been studying multitasking for quite some time. And multitasking means performing more than one task in parallel or in rapid succession. And there have been a number of works showing that multitasking 
it is closely linked to one's productivity and well-being because you can you can imagine that if you are multitasking, probably you're not paying full attention to the thing that you are going on, and uh, you probably there could be you know mental um me quite quite some mental pressure when you're trying to do multitasking, so it is linked to your well-being as well. So there have been a number of works showing that how multitasking is quite important in, in helping one's be, being productive or being um, being digitally or, or being you know creative or being you know um, healthy at workplace. So that's why that it's quite important to study this kind of multitasking behavior. And especially on the remote meeting, um, as we've experienced, multitasking is something that is quite ubiquitous. Uh, for example, one could be checking emails or doing some other works when, when you're meeting with others. But there has been a gap in literature. Um, I'm trying to understand when, how, and why people engage in multitasking behavior on the remote meetings. So that is what brings us to this research work. Um, in this particular work, we are proposing a mixed method analysis of multitasking behavior during remote meetings. Well, we have you know, one part that is more on the large scale data analysis to ensure that we have the generalizability of findings. And on the other hand, having some qualitative aspects attached to this kind of a large scale analysis um, so as to make sure that we have some nuanced findings um, in this kind of, in, in this study. So there are a number of research questions that we seek to address in this particular work. So first of all, um, perhaps most straightforward, how much multitasking is happening during remote meetings? And secondly, what factors associated with multitasking during remote meetings? Thirdly, what do people do when multitasking during remote meetings? And finally, what are the consequences of multitasking during remote meetings? So most specifically, as I mentioned earlier, the mixed method approach included a regression analysis on large-scale telemetry data set and a diary study, so as to ensure both the generalizability and also uh, in-depth findings of what is going on in, under this kind of remote meeting multitasking behavior. So let's first talk about the large-scale uh, data analysis that, that we have been doing. So the large-scale telemetry data sets that we have been using include a number of different aspects. So first of all, um, since we are talking about remote meetings, it makes sense for us to get some kind of meeting-related action. And we are using that from Microsoft Teams, um, as this is a collaboration with the Microsoft research folks. And some other things to represent people's work behavior include email usage from Outlook and file edits from SharePoint and OneDrive. So the specific data set that we have been drawing is actually from, um, from, from Microsoft employees in US. Um, and I think this is a pretty good approach as you know, a Microsoft employee, most of the work they've been doing is done through Microsoft related softwares. So then they, they meet on Microsoft Teams and they, um, they send emails and they fire edits over other uh, Microsoft softwares, such as Outlook and SharePoint OneDrive. So it is a good place to make sure that on the remote work setting, we could have a pretty good picture of what those Microsoft employees are doing instead of having just partial observations. And for this particular study, we collected four separate week-long snapshots from February to May 2020, um, because we, we, we used this four different uh, separate snapshots to represent different phase of the uh, pandemic. So as you know, like uh, the pandemic, it, it broke out in US uh, around March 2020. So February is kind of like the pre-COVID period. And then it's the transition phase um, in March. And then in April and May, it's more like uh, it's people get accustomed to the remote work and they're mostly working online. So yeah, this is the data set that we have been using. And based on the digital trace that we have collected through 
this number of Microsoft softwares, we derive a number of mating characteristics so that we could have some kind of um, independent variables where we could understand how the how the mating is going. And we are using that to correlate with uh, the fact whether people they're multitasking during remote meetings. So for this particular work, we derive from the digital trace, meeting duration, meeting size, meeting types, um, and the scheduling of that meeting. For example, uh, in when in, in the hour of the day is that meeting being held and when in the day of the week. So as you can see on the right hand side, it's the distributions of those meeting characteristics. And just from this distribution, you can see something that is pretty interesting. For example, for the meeting duration itself, you can see that there's a peak around 30 minutes and 30, 60 minutes, meaning that you know there's a, quite some meetings that is happening around uh, 30 minutes and 60 minutes, which is um, consistent with, uh, with our experience. And you can see that most of the meeting is relatively small, um, and there are a number of larger meetings as well. And for meeting types, most of the meeting is scheduled meetings um, and recurrent meetings, but sometimes people, they do have ad hoc meeting as well. So for example, you could, you could imagine ourselves doing something like, um, can we jump up to a call to get something done together? And that's kind of the ad hoc uh, meeting type under Microsoft Teams classification. And we describe, uh, we, we make this uh, different meeting properties into bins so as to better facilitate the re regression analysis. And we have the meeting duration divided into, sorry, zero to 20 minutes meetings, 20 to 40 minutes meetings, 40 to 8 minutes meetings, and about 80 minutes meetings. And we also divide it uh, in similar fashion, different meeting size, meeting types, hour of the day, day of the week. And we put them into the regression analysis, which I'll talk more in the next slides. So for the regression analysis, we joined the three data sources that I mentioned, representing uh, behavior of people on different platforms by unique user identifiers. Um, and for each meeting user pair, we could actually do something like email multitasking and file multitasking by looking at whether the same individual uh, during the same time period when they are having a remote meeting, whether they have been doing something else on other platforms, such as email or, um, or, or doing something over OneDrive and SharePoint, there's some kind of um, multitasking behavior. So basically the way that we did that is looking at each meeting user pair and looking at whether uh, that user is having some other records um, over the other platforms, given that we are able to join their user identifier. So here comes the um, here comes our definition of the email multitasking and file multitasking, as well as non-multitasking. And then we run a conditionally a conditional logistic regression analysis to understand the relationship between multitasking and meeting characteristics. And we also control for individual differences in regression through individual fixed effects and through standard error at the meeting level. So just to note, and I think I also discussed more on this kind of limitations of this data set. Um, of course, uh, we noticed that people, they have been doing something um, other than email or file when they actually multitasking, but um, you know, this is also kind of the limitation of the digital trace that perhaps the observation that we could have is more, um, more related to, you know, the work patterns and it is quite dependent on what platforms that we could have. So email multitasking and file multitasking is something that we could have um, full picture of. And so that's why that in this very study that we focused on these two specific actions and we are using the quality aspect to, um, of the study to complement what we have for here. So yeah, as I mentioned, the second part of the study is a diary study where we asked uh, a number of people, what have you noticed about multitasking in your recent online meetings with a list of sub prompts, like asking them how, when, and why they multitask. 
and the diary studies ran also similar at similar time period between mid April and mid August 2020, and we collected uh, around 800 responses. So now let's talk talk about the findings that we have got through the pro proposed approach. So the first thing that we have observed from the digital trace is from February to May, we find that around 30% of meetings, it involves email multitasking, and around 25% of meetings, it involves bio multitasking. And um, with, the, with, with the aid of the diary study, we also tried to find some um, mechanisms or explanations why this is going on. And people, they have been, uh, some things that we have been concluding from our qualitative part is we find that people there say, more multitasking, is this a, it, it might be a possible result of the work rhythm adaptation. And the fact that when you work remotely, um, it's pretty easy to turn off and uh, turn on and turn off video and audio. It may actually encourage more multitasking since you're not giving the presence. Uh, so it's quite, um, so people, they're finding themselves getting more and more um, into multitasking. And based on our regression, we find something pretty interesting on the relationship bet uh, between whether people engage in multitasking and the characteristics of the meeting. So we find more multitasking is happening in large, long morning and recurrent meetings, as well as meetings with lower relevance and engagement. Um, so for here, you can see um, it's two plus from our regression analysis, and it's representing the odds of people engaging in uh, multitasking versus the baselines. And you can see as the meeting gets larger, more and more people they're engaging in multitasking. And you can see that the likelihood of you engaging in some kind of multitasking behavior for, um, for larger meetings, so in this case, meetings with more than 10 people, you can see the likelihood of engaging multitasking behavior is roughly two times the likelihood you, you would engage in one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. So yeah, in similar fashion, we are showing that multitasking happen more in large long morning and recurrent meetings. And um, perhaps some of the things there to our expectation, for example, larger and long meetings, it makes sense that um, people, they are not paying uh, full attention. But I think uh, the really interesting results from our findings here is that we find for morning meetings, it's actually people, they are likely to, um, to engage in, uh, they're, 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 they're likely to do more multitasking stuff. So I think this is kind of like implications that is, is not easily, um, easily observable from the findings that we have. Uh, or the intuitions that we have. Hanchen, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, about that last slide. Oh, okay, sure, sounds good. So I just want to make sure I understand the numbers. In the bottom left, mm -hmm. is this saying that in, for example, meetings with more than 10 attendees, um, 35 or so, percent of those meetings will have at least one person um, mm -hmm. multitasking? Exactly. Yes, exactly. I, so the left I'm hand side- I'm astonished by that. I'm astonished mm -hmm. by that number. Just from the meetings that I've observed, I would okay. guess that in meetings with more than 10 people, the probability that somebody is multitasking is indistinguishable from 100%. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Uh, so how do, yeah, you, I, how do you explain only 30%? Yeah, I think this is probably because the fact that, you know, like um, due to this data, uh, we, what, as, as I mentioned earlier, what we are observing is actually, you know, it's actually email multitasking and file multitasking, whether they're doing something work related, but, you know, like there could be many other ways, which I, I will actually explain a bit later, that uh, people engage in multitasking. So maybe they're looking at their social media or they're, um, I don't know, doing household chores or some, some other things that making them not fully attend to the meeting itself. So it's probably the case that in terms of work, they're, they're, they're doing something 
else um, without that high percentage of time um, because it might be uh, an over, uh, it, it, it can become some kind of burden where you think of if you engage in something that needs attention, people may tend not to do that. So um, yeah, I would say that this is probably the case that, um, you know, because of the courage of this particular data, um, there is some multitasking behavior that is missing here um, that makes this percentage maybe lower than our expectation. Yeah. Uh, one follow-on question is, do you have an idea of uh, what percentage of Microsoft employees do not use Outlook for their email? Um, I do not really know uh, the exact percentage, but um, so far as I know, at least when, when we were preparing for that um, uh, research, I think um, I think the majority of the people they are just using my, uh, the Outlook for emails as default because it's kind of like pre-installed or something where people they, they will use this, that kind of bundle. Yeah, I can imagine there's an expectation, but mm -hmm. there might be some people that choose to buck the expectation for one reason or another. Yes, yes, that could be definitely the case. And yeah, I agree that it would be, uh, it, it would make sense to check that stuff and add, add some details on that as well. Okay. Uh, I'm not certain that we're seeing all the messages in the chat at the moment. So let me pause and see if there's anybody else that wants to ask a question right now. Mm -hmm. Just jump in with your sound. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe so, I'll just oh, ask a, a question I yeah. put in the chat, which is, okay. um, are you collecting data? So to collect the data, they just have to be using one of the Microsoft applications. It doesn't matter if it's on the same machine or not. Is that correct or not? Right, exactly. So basically, this data is collected when it, it's kind of like the, the telemetry data or the log data. On, on the back end of all, all those softwares that I mentioned. So as long as someone is using that platform um, and they are having some kind of actions, for example, they're clicking a button or they're doing some action at certain time step, there, there will be some data recorded um, on, on the Microsoft end. So it's that kind of log data or telemetry data that we are using to, to see whether people they are doing anything um, on, on that particular platform. So, so actually, all users, regardless whether it's Microsoft employees or people from other organizations, as long as they're, they're using Microsoft products, their data will be, um, their actions or their, or their clicks or their any behavior that they have anything to do with their, with, with, with their software will have a digital record. Um, we are using Microsoft employees here only because part, part of the reason is, as I mentioned, um, it's much clearer to see uh, that what a Microsoft employee is doing because they, they tend to do most of their work on Microsoft softwares. And on the other hand, it's because, you know, it makes sense to, um, to ensure, uh, ensure that this research is ethical. So I think there is kind of like internal agreement from Microsoft that they could use uh, use employee data to do analysis, but maybe not other users. So that's why that here we are only using the Microsoft US employee. But the data is all there. Uh, I think Han Chen has said he's available for interruption. So just jump yes, in. that's true. Feel free to interrupt me if you find any anything you would want to discuss or comment on. All right, I can move on. So yeah, um, here, as I mentioned, we have uh, a qualitative aspect as well, so as to explain some of the other factors that we might have been, we might not able to observe through telemetry data. So there are also something uh, that it's about extrinsic meeting characteristics um, or more about the motivations of people that 
um, make people more likely to multitask. So for example, um, we find that people, they multitask during meetings to catch up on other words and multitask during meetings um, due to external distractions. And this part is especially interesting um, because, because we have been hearing a lot of people there saying external extractions, um, making them multitasking and external distractions could actually not only be um, something that is happening around them, but it could actually coming from interface. So for example, a lot of people there are saying um, they get interrupted and they multitask because when they have a meeting, they hear that they're they, they 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 hear the sound of the, their email notification. So you know when something is going up and people they're tempted to check what is going on, and that could lead to some some sorts of multitasking. And also interesting, we 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 heard that people they multitask during meetings for anxiety relief uh, during the pandemic period. And. Uh, we also want to learn more about what do people do when multitasking, um, because for the telemetry data analysis part, we're only able to look at um, the file and the email multitasking. Um, but actually consistent to our intuition, quite some people they mentioned that uh, both work-related and non-work-related multitasking behavior, and actually around 30% of people they mentioned that they conducted email multitasking. So for non-work related multitasking, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there have been many activities going on. For example, they probably, they, they may be checking social media or do some household chores, or we have some, uh, some responses from participants on that particular point. And in terms of the consequence of multitasking, we've also got, um, two different kind of consequences that people have been talking about. Some are talking about multitasking in more positive way, whereas others they're talking about multitasking um, slightly more negative. So for positive consequence, people they have been saying it helps them with productivity, which makes sense because they get more things done at once. Um, and some people, although I think it's quite a few people, but I personally find it quite interesting, they also mentioned that multitasking, making them able to do something that they do something uh, at the same time without um, without having to you know deal with the time conflicts or all sorts of things. So some people they are saying that they're attending multiple meetings at the same time so that um, they could be there at the same time and eventually helping them boost their productivity. Although this is kind of like limited case, but it is showing that if if the person find it okay or, or they're comfortable with multitasking, there could be some ways to help them boost productivity. But on the, definitely most of the answers has been on the negative side and people they're saying something that is corresponding to prior literature, um, negative aspects of multitasking, including it's making people uh, they have a sense of loss of attention and engagement and they're, that they are not paying full attention to what is going on in the meeting. And there has been mental pressure on their end that, that is making them feel fatigued, um, that they are feeling tired when they multitask um, during the meetings. And especially in the, in the early period of, uh, re period of remote work in the pandemic when Every, everyone is video conferencing. Uh, there's also something going on with this kind of uh, video conferencing uh, culture or that kind of, uh, under those kind of contexts, what would be appropriate to do. And some people they're saying, in, especially in early period of the pandemic, they find people um, multitasking as a, is, is kind of showing disrespect to others because they would expect to see people they would pay perhaps more attention during the meeting and people would feel awkward if they have been caught up by someone else when for example we're asking uh, some sorts of questions and asking them to give feedbacks but they are not able to um, they are not able to because they haven't been paying full attention to the meeting themselves so some people back to end find 
a sense of that disrespecting this kind of multitasking behavior. So yes, so basically um, what I just discussed is the findings from the telemetry data and the diary studies that we have so far. Um, and in this particular paper, based on the telemetry data sets and uh, based on the part, uh, based on the telemetry data sets as well as the diary study, we've concluded um, two implications for people. And on one hand, it's a best practice guidelines for uh, remote meetings, and this is perhaps more for managers than for employees. And on the other hand, we also have a number of design implications discussed in our paper that is more um, how we could leverage this kind of remote work patterns into the design better tools to support uh, productivity. So for best practice guidelines for remote meetings, we have been discussing avoiding important meetings in the morning, reduce the number of unnecessary meetings, shorten meeting durations and serve breaks, and encourage active contribution. These are uh, suggestions that we made on top of the observations be between the likelihood of multitasking and multiple factors that we study in this particular paper. And the final suggestions that we, we discuss in our paper is allowing space for positive multitasking. Um, since, as I mentioned earlier, people sometimes they would find um, multitasking to be useful and to be productive. And it is the case that throughout the meeting, um, perhaps sometimes you do not really need to pay full attention. So it shouldn't really be a cultural burden where when you see someone is multitasking, you just count them as something that is disrespectful. So yeah, we discuss a number of um, implications for running remote meetings on that side in our paper. Yeah. And for the design implications part, we're mostly talking about uh, perhaps we could imagine some future work done under the remote meeting uh, under remote meeting scenario that is for supporting, uh, for example, focus mode for remote meetings because we noticed that, as I mentioned, a lot of people they are mentioning they are not paying full attention because there have been external distractions and many of which is actually coming from the software itself. So maybe if there is a focus mode and and I think there's actually stuff like that and features like that, that is um, Microsoft Teams or um, other softwares um, that is allowing people to, you know, when they have important meeting or they want to focus itself, mute notifications from other softwares. And we have been also thinking about other types of enga engagements during meetings. So once follow-ups works to this specific research is there have been some some other people studying the role of chat in this kind of video conferencing because it is interesting as um, video conferencing itself is is making possible kind of like a synchronous in interaction between different participants or workers but uh, chat it is providing a way that is extending that kind of synchronous um, meeting or synchronous collaboration is something that you know people could do um, whenever they are available. So how to you know um, make best use of this chat? And I think people nowadays they are getting more and more um, comfortable and better at do this kind of um, parallel chats or chats before and after meeting to follow ups um, nowadays than than one year earlier. And we have been also talking about. Um, some tools to help people decide which meetings or which part of the meetings to attend. And this could be, you know, based on um, natural language processing and uh, based to calculate some sorts of similarity score or relevant score for people so that they could decide maybe some meetings they, it, it makes, makes sense for them to attend, whereas maybe other meetings is perhaps not so important for them and they could consider skipping it or watch the recording um, or just use part of the, um, say, transcripts and maybe taking a look at it after the meeting is held. And, and finally, we have been talking about some things to support positive multitasking. And here, positive multitasking is basically means um, if there's anything that is um, kind of related or they could do alongside with the meetings, maybe there's a good way to figure that out. So maybe, for example, um, uh, there could be a better screen split or there could be better interface design so that um, people could 
um, do do other things. If it is um, it doesn't make them feel bad or it helps boost their productivity, they probably they could do that um, through some some sorts of better uh, better tool design as well. Yeah, this is basically uh, the key takeaways from this particular research. Um, and I wonder if you have any questions about this particular research, or if not, I can move on to my next part um, of this presentation. So there have been a ton of questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, I wonder <laughs> if maybe Ohad wants to jump in and just ask. Uh, I have a question about uh, your, your last de design implications about supporting positive multi uh, testing. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious, for the meeting organizer, did you really want to support the multitasking? Because like, if I am a meeting organizer and I invite people to join, join my meeting, I would expect they fully like involved in this meeting, like not support other multitasking. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's a great point. And I think um, I would have, um, my reaction to this would be, um, as I mentioned, uh, first of all, uh, the motivation of the meeting or the goal of the meeting, I think it's really two parts. Um, and there are different kinds of meeting, obviously. Some they are probably for, to achieve some kind of productivity goal. For example, people meet together to achieve some kind of, to get some work done. Or it could be something else like, um, I don't know, like social meetings or some other things where the goal of the meeting is really to help people stay connected. And so for different types of meeting, perhaps that would mean different levels of engagement. And from a productivity, productivity point of view, uh, sometimes, and, and, and this I think it also has, has, has to do with the nature of the meeting itself, um, sometimes perhaps it makes sense to be more engaged in the meeting, whereas maybe at, at other time, the engagement is perhaps not, not the first priority people would be, they would be considering. And for multitasking itself, um, if it would be something uh, kind of relevant, but not directly relevant to the meeting itself, it perhaps could be a good way to get productivity increase. Um, for example, one, one example that people would like to use when we, when we think about this kind of positive multitasking is actually some kind of related to the meeting, but in terms of action, it could be counted as multitasking. So for, for example, you could imagine people, they're taking notes or they're sending follow-ups or they're checking for some source of information that is in terms of content related to the meeting itself. But in terms of action, um, or at least from the standpoint of the telemetry or the standpoint of the interface, it is not directly on, say, Zooms or it is not directly on Teams but it is some sorts of other actions that people they are doing during that period of time. So from that standpoint or from that definition, in terms of work, it is kind of um, multitasking um, that is different from fully engaging to, to the interactions happening on the screen. So that's why we are arguing to support that kind of say, uh, following up or checking up information or do anything that in terms of content that is boosting their um, their productivity, perhaps there could be a better way of say interface design or uh, their space for us to get these things done better. And of course, I think all this depends on um, um, whether people they would find something that is related to the meetings or not, and whether mm -hmm. it is acceptable and encouraged to do that or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's basically like, divide the multitasking into work-related and not work-related, right? For the media yes, organizers, they would like to that notion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I guess um, I had just sort of a I don't know how to turn this into a question, but uh, you mentioned the chat in meetings as being a place where people connect and also facilitating connections after the meeting. And it's started to become even the whole point of the meeting for some of the meetings I attend. So we have a lab mm -hmm. lunch where 
the uh like well you know we just go over an agenda and when i moderate that meeting i feel just like i don't know i i it, the, I, I'm speaking to no one because the point of the meeting is just to get everyone in one place so they can chat with each other in the chat. Mm -hmm. But then they need me as the speaker to be there because otherwise they're not going to show up because there's not like a point or something. I, and I just, it feels really bad because I'm completely superfluous and I don't know. I, I don't know how to manage that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a great point. And I think there's really, as I mentioned, space between, you know, on, on this kind of digital platforms, you could have different sorts of collaboration or different sorts of interaction going on. How to, you know, balance or um, make things work together is something that I think there, there should really be more research for Tom. Um, and because I think there are quite some works that is talking about um, under a specific interaction will be uh, good for people and how could we get this, that particular interaction better. But there is um, much fewer work that is um, how to get all those kind of um, multi-modality or, or all those sorts of different interactions work together to achieve some sorts of collective goal. So it's more like how do different features or how do different parts within a specific software or within when people they are trying to get things down, how to uh, jointly letting those software soft, softwares or letting those tools doing their work in the best way possible. So yeah, I agree that um, there should be more work on that and how to how to say under different situations decide what would be the best mode and what would be the best way of different modes working together would be something important and interesting to help. Um, boost either productivity or well-being or creativity. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll ask it in the chat. Um, have you looked at the relationship between the amount of multitasking of a participant and the density of meetings per, meetings per week? Um, mm -hmm. So if you have lots of meetings in, in a week, then you're going to be we're asking more in the other mm -hmm. way. Uh, yes, yeah. So, so we've been looking at uh, the number of um, meetings as well, and um, so I, I don't think it's included here in this particular work because back then one issue that we encountered, uh, as I remember, is um, sometimes. Well, actually, this is kind of like the limitation of telemetry data as well. Uh, which I don't think I discussed much, but telemetry data sometimes, although it's large scale, it could be um, because the, the goal of those data is not really to support research. It's uh, the goal of those data originally was to support um, better debugging their softwares. So sometimes there could be, the telemetry data can be quite dirty. So sometimes, um, you know, like uh, you're not really able to, to, to be sure what is going on with certain parts of the data. And the same meeting, sometimes it could, could have mul multiple meetings, uh, multiple re records in the data and even separate IDs. And there could also be the case that, you know, um, actually I think when the, the returns start to work remotely, video conferencing tool itself is still um, much under development. So there could be all sorts of issues where you first connect you then some issues going on and then this, you disconnect and then you attach to it uh, again. So, but essentially it's the same meeting, but you, you have several records associated with that. So yeah, I think when we were doing this research, um, when we were exploring the data set, we definitely see that a, a, lot, a lot of that is doing, going on. And we use a number of heuristics, try to determine whether the records we, we did some, I think, clustering and something like that um, to, to make sure that the, uh, that what we observed is actually from the same meeting and from the same, same individuals. Uh, we, we have did quite some work on that. Um, but eventually, I think in the final version of the paper, we dropped that frequency um, stuff um, of how many people there, uh, sorry, how many meetings an individual have been having uh, during the course. Because we just think that maybe we 
we are not sure whether we should rely on other facts that, or we should trust um, the cleaning efforts. Um, so essentially, all the things that we have been analyzing um, is actually on the, I would say, um, meeting user uh, multitasking level. So the basic unit of, of our, our analysis eventually is looking at a specific meeting, whether in that specific meeting a user is is you know doing something else. So um, that's the basic unit that we have been working on. That kind of um, that kind of pairs, rather than um, you know whether for an individual how that individual throughout the course of a week how many meetings that individual have because we are not sure exactly how many meetings that individual has even though we have done lots of work on that. And so, so we have meeting records as well. So. so just to quickly follow up, uh, uh, so okay, but you're saying the data is noisy, too noisy to actually make a claim, but is it suggestive? I mean, do you see that there's like a, a correlation? You think there is? Okay. So if we somehow had a better way to measure it, you could say this is the optimal numbers of, of week of meetings the week should be having if you want to keep productive or something like that. There's a kind of mm -hmm. very specific managerial advice you can make out of this uh, if only yes. you had uh, accurate data. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. So I think um, maybe more broadly, I think a good way to make use of this kind of large scale digital trace is on one hand, um, we should leverage its strength and the strength is really, it's very large scale and you could get to know how people are doing rather than say 12 participants. So uh, yeah, this is a good side of it. But of course, even that it's not directly built for research purpose, um, there might be all sorts of issues with, with those data. Um, so I think the best scenario would be on one hand, um, you have this kind of large scale data to um, explore and you, you could find some kind of patterns and then you, you should really dive in to have some other evidence, for example, qualitative evidence to, to you know, just use this as, as some kind of evidence to, to make sure that you, you could trust and trust the results from the telemetry data analysis and there could actually be some uh, other things uh, also others either theories or explanations to come for what is going on with with, with the data okay great um, any other question just to let you know we, we will have some people that will need to drop out at the hour to uh, go to two other meetings so mm -hmm. if you have any things that you absolutely want to say in the next three minutes would be the right time. But then we can discuss and uh, and see the rest of your presentation since we've okay. slowed you down considerably. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no problem. So maybe I could share a bit about in the next three minutes about uh, briefly about the work, um, the abstract of the work that I've been doing for the second project and uh, what's my major takeaways uh, throughout my experience with de dealing with kind of digital trace. So the second work that we have been doing, so, uh, doing is actually to study uh, the relationship between work patterns, language, and the, the outcome of the, uh, the collaboration experience. So basically whether people they're enjoying their collaboration or they're feeling really bad um, during the process. Um, well, I, I will discuss more when, if people have time, but basically it's, there's a relationship between the collaboration process and the language people use and the work uh, people have been doing. Um, and essentially with, with regard to, to the outcome or this, for example, the satisfaction of the team members. So we are able to build a predictive model on top of that. So yeah, what this suggests is that there could be opportunities for people to you know, leverage this kind of digital trace to make some predictions or make some kind of um, make some kind of sensing on top of the data that we have currently to to sense how the team is going, how the project is going before something bad or something um, not um, not expected happens. So we are proving that it's kind of ways where we could leverage data to, to do. So that's kind of like the, the major takeaways I would say for the second work that I would like to talk about. So basically I think um, as a whole, I would say digital trace, um, the opportunity it provides us is first of all, understand what is going on with the, with the work patterns to have a better sense of that. 
And secondly, uh, the second piece that, that is making me thinking is that um, aside from this kind of understanding of people's work patterns, perhaps you could get a better sense of, um, you know, using some kind of machine learning or use some kind of um, predictive modeling so as to make that data, um, use that to predict and maybe on top of that to intervene things before um, before something go something goes down. So basically, not nudge people to move in the right direction and to boost productivity or well-being in some source as people define. Um, so I would say, like it's really given the ubiquitous of the data, we could build on top of that some new things that we probably can cannot really imagine um, earlier. So yeah, I would say. Yeah, that, that's the strength of this kind of digital trace. And um, if if we we are able to you know get access to that, and I, I would really expect that there will be more work and more space and more interesting findings and implications on top of that. Thank you. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. We have now time for questions. I will start with the question, mm -hmm. um, which is, what kind of implications do you see for the design of tools for remote collaboration? Um, yeah, so I think in terms of tool for remote collaboration, um, there are definitely many ways that I could see. Um, I would perhaps give some examples for the things that I've been thinking about. Um, so first of all, as, as, as a question from Nico, I think there, there could be definitely better ways where we design um, tools where we have multiple sorts of interaction, but there should be really be a balance between different sorts of interactions. And sometimes certain modes of interaction would work better, but other times maybe um, it should be the other way around. So there should not be just say one single way of interacting with, with each other, say only video or only chat, but there may be some ways to to balance or combine them together. So this is one thing that I've been thinking about. And the other things, which is actually, um, let me turn to those slides here. Um, yeah, basically, um, although I just briefly mentioned that, but for the second work, um, we, we're, as I mentioned, we're proving that using the data, it could actually provide us some benefits to, you know, to, to use that to send some kind of characteristics of the of the teams or characteristics of the project or the collaboration or the project itself um, in a more timely manner. And because I think most of the current practice at workplace is really uh, to, to, to either sense productivity or to sense team satisfaction or or, the, or, or how the project going is, is really like the HR department, you know, um, they send out surveys or they conduct interviews with people involved in the project in quite a post hoc manner where, where they ask about the experience of people. Um, but definitely there are many issues with that. So first of all, there could be, you know, first of all, it's not timely enough. It's often happening way after the project has, has been conducted. So there's little, little space for them to really, um, intervene or do something differently throughout the process of that project. If the project has already failed, <laughs> it is hard for you to change anything except for the next time that you, you're doing something similar. But I think this kind of uh, digital trace where you're able to getting a sense of getting more sense of what is going on with the project and especially under this kind of remote setting, it actually brings about the possibilities to for you to track and to 
intervene, I mean, in a good sense, if you're done in the right way, in an ethical way, um, um, there's space for you to nudge or to intervene through the process so that maybe you could improve the productivity and you could improve the relationship between team members and they're more happy working with each other. And eventually what this means to the organization would be something like if, you know, people, they're happy with their teams, happy with their works, there could be less churn, they're, they, they, they are, they're likely to stay at it, their works. So, so I would say like for, for designs, another thing that I, I personally am very interested in and passionate about is how, how to best leverage the possibilities that we have the data and we have the opportunity to sense and to keep track of the, how the team is going. Then um, building on top of that, um, building some tools, either uh, to, to achieve specific goals, to interact with people, either to you know, um, make, make, make the process more efficient, make people feel better, or, um, or just you know, getting, getting a good sense of the, what is going on and giving better suggestions for managers. So I would say that um, that's the, the, the other part that I've been thinking a lot about.